glad somebody was taking notice. Isn't that a weird verse? Like, be nice to people because then, be nice to your enemies. And now feel really bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Denise here, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, looking forward to meeting you over a cuppa if uh, I haven't met you before. And yes, um, look, occasionally, not very often, but occasionally, I get to Friday evening and I read through the sermon I've prepared and I think, this is rubbish. <laughs> and I hit delete and I start again. This was one of those weeks. <laughs> it has been in my head to speak on the topic of forgiveness from the start of this year. And so I slotted it into my sermon schedule for August and then I forgot about it until a few weeks ago and then I, I sort of noticed it on, on my schedule and I've been watching it get closer. And um, I thought I knew what I wanted to say. I had a plan, but somehow it just didn't work out. And in fact, I don't know, sometime Friday night I was thinking, maybe I should just pull an old sermon and just like scrap this one entirely. And then I thought, no, I can't do that. Well, why has this been so hard? It's because I know from my own life and I know from hearing stories from people in this congregation and from, you know, other friends and, and neighbours that, that forgiveness is not just hard, it's also a really tricky topic. And I don't want to be the pastor who stands up here, reads some Bible verses and says, see, God forgave you, so you have to give each other, you have to forgive each other, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. And if you can't or you won't, well, then you're not a very good Christian, really, are you? I don't want to do that. Life and faith and forgiveness needs much more reflection and nuance than that. But I do think it's helpful to think about the topic because while it's a tricky topic, it's a really important topic. It's not a healthy way to live, to go through life accumulating bitterness and resentment against the people in our lives. And I reckon that some of you have met people like that. They're not happy people. They seem unable to see any good in their lives because they're so fixated on something that's happened in the past. So, if you don't mind, I'm just sort of going to meander today, just sort of wander randomly through this topic, sort of just poking here and there. Um, and I'm not planning on telling you that you have to do anything. I'm just going to throw a few things out there and see what sticks. Um, and, and these will be things that I've, I've thought a lot about over the years. So here's some, to start with, um, some questions that I've thought a lot about. What does it mean to forgive? Is forgiveness unconditional? Or does it depend on whether the other person repents? Should forgiveness always aim for a restoration of relationship? Or can I forgive somebody and not expect to be reconciled to them? If I'm still angry or resentful at someone, does that mean I haven't forgiven them? Should I try to forget the wrong that was done against me? Or does forgiveness mean getting to a place like where it's, it's like the wrong just never even happened? Or is it unrealistic to think that a relationship could ever be the same again? So there's some questions that I've pondered over uh, for, well, for a really long time. I wonder if you've pondered some of those same things. The things that concern me most 
around this topic and the way we think about it. Firstly, here's what concerns me, that there's a lot of pressure in Christian circles, I think particularly, to forgive immediately and completely, and if you don't, then you're not a very good Christian. Well, I think we need to ditch that. Forgiveness is sometimes a conscious decision. Sometimes it's a long process. Sometimes it's not that big a deal. And other times it feels like an insurmountable wall that you can't possibly scale. Because we can't see inside another human being, often we don't understand why something that doesn't seem like a big deal to us is a big deal to them. Another thing that concerns me is the assumption that forgiveness means that the relationship goes back to what it was, as if nothing ever happened. This is what gets us into a quagmire of problems when it comes to domestic violence and other forms of abuse. After forgiveness has taken place, a relationship might continue as, as it always did. In fact, forgiveness has this huge potential to strengthen a relationship. But forgiveness is not <coughs> incompatible with leaving a relationship, with putting boundaries around a relationship, with renegotiating a relationship. Forgiveness is not an invitation to communicate, I've forgiven you, so you know, come and wipe your feet on me again. That con concerns me, those assumptions. The next one that bothers me might surprise you, and it's going to take a bit of time to unpack. So just bear with me. One of the things that bothers me is the idea that forgiveness is something that you do for yourself and not for the other person. Today, there's a lot of emphasis on forgiving someone because it's psychologically beneficial for us. And I 100% agree, I do. Holding on to resentment against somebody, not being able to let it go, absolutely is just harmful to us. It eats us up inside, it makes us bitter and twisted, gets, us in, the, gets in the way of us moving on. And um, as I said, I, I reckon you probably know people like that. So we absolutely need to come to some sort of internal sense of forgiveness of those who have wronged us, this internal letting go of resentment and blame. I agree with all of that. But there's a bit of the story that that doesn't tell because it assumes that the goal of forgiveness is our own psychological health. But unless the person that you're trying to forgive is yourself, there's at least one other person involved, isn't there? Because forgiveness always involves a relationship with another person. One person can decide to forgive, but <coughs> what about the other person? Like what's, what's their role in this? How are they involved in this forgiveness thing? Well, the flip side to forgiveness is repentance. Realising that what you've done has hurt another person deciding to change or take steps so that it doesn't happen again and trying to make amends for the harm that was caused. That's what repentance is. And there's a debate over whether forgiveness can happen without the other person repenting. Do you have to wait until somebody comes and apologises to you and tries to make things right? Or can you forgive whether repentance happens or not? It's kind of a live question. And I suspect that the answer to that question might not always be the same answer. It might depend on the situation. And this is the question that I've spent the longest time thinking about. <coughs> and I have some thoughts. Hopefully, my thoughts might prompt you to think through this and come to your own conclusions based on your life experience and, um, and your understanding of the Christian faith. So whether you can 
whether you have to kind of wait till somebody repents in order to forgive them, or whether forgiveness is something that happens, whether or not that happens. Here's my thoughts. I think that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the ultimate goal of forgiveness is not psychological well-being, but reconciliation of relationship. Now, I've already noted that that might not be possible for a variety of reasons, and some of those reasons are really good reasons. So I want to kind of hold that out there uh, while I say this other stuff. I've already noted as well that reconciliation might not mean the relationship looks exactly the same as it did before. But I do think that for the biblical writers, reconciliation is the desired outcome of conflict. And I think about when the Bible was written and the culture of the time, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Bible was written in a culture that revolved around the community. So most people lived in smaller communities, um, not really big urban ones, and you, you didn't move too far from your extended family groups. Everybody knew one another. So if you had a conflict, you couldn't really move away from it. That wasn't an option. We live in a highly individualised culture where life revolves around the individual. So if you have a conflict at work, well, you just go get another job. Uh, if you have a conflict at church, you just go to another church. It happens all the time. But if you want to live in community with other people, then forgiveness is not really an optional extra. Because when you live in a community, it's not going to be long before one person does something intentionally or unintentionally that harms another person. And so repentance and making amends is also not an optional extra. And these two, they, they go hand in hand. So rather than being some sort of virtue, rather than seeing repentance and forgiveness as this sort of like really spiritual thing that really spiritual Christians do, Actually, they're just necessary, pragmatic courses of action in order to live in a harmonious community. And so I see this equation uh, in, in the biblical writings that reconciliation equals repentance plus forgiveness. It's a nice, neat little equation, isn't it? So forgiveness without repentance... Forgiveness without repentance, that's not going to create reconciliation. And repentance without forgiveness won't do it either. It's kind of like a dance. If one partner is not doing the right steps in the dance, then the dance just, it just can't work, no matter how hard the other partner tries. And so in a perfect world, here's how it works. The person who wronged someone repents, they take responsibility for what they've done, and they make amends. The person who has been wronged forgives and releases the person from their debt. And in that way, relationships restored. What was broken is now fixed, even strengthened, and peace and harmony returns. That's in a perfect world. This is not a perfect world. In our messy world, Sometimes the person who wronged another does not repent, does not think they've done anything wrong, or thinks their actions were justified by what the other person did or did not do. Sometimes it's very hard to understand who actually wronged who. Rarely is there one innocent party, completely innocent, and the other completely guilty party. That's very rare. Sometimes when the two parties drill down on what happened, it turns out there was actually no wrong that happened at all. It was just a misunderstanding. One person interpreted words or actions in a way that wasn't intended by the other. So how do we live in our much less than perfect world? Well, <coughs> look, see, I've got those slides around the wrong way. Never mind. 
How do we live in our much less than perfect world? Again, these are just thoughts. It seems to me that if reconciliation is an option for a conflict that I find myself in, then that's the option to work towards. Because peace and harmony between two people is better than not peace and harmony between two people. And that reconciliation is not likely to be perfect and it's probably not going to look exactly how I want it to look. But it doesn't have to be perfect. Any reconciliation is better than no reconciliation. But if in my own discernment and wisdom, I believe that reconciliation is not a good option, that there are reasons why my relationship with another person can't be restored, that one person or the other in the relationship is going to be further damaged by trying to continue to reconcile, then I might need to walk away and I might need, how to, I might need to figure out how to live with that unresolved situation. And if I can't resolve it externally with the other person, then I have to figure out how to come to some sort of internal resolution within myself. One thing that I could consider is my side of the equation, the dance steps that make up my part of the dance. So uh, as Jazz read, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. If I've wronged someone, is there some reflecting that I need to do on my own actions and attitudes so I can grow from the experience? Is there something I can do that might undo some of the damage that I've caused? In that way, I've at least taken responsibility for my own dance steps, even if the other person isn't dancing with me. I'm not responsible for their dance steps. But I'll need to be careful even in doing that because my offers of repentance, my making amends could be taken and used against me. So I might just want to be careful and wise and maybe check out the wisdom of my decisions with a trusted friend. If I'm the one who's been wronged, and of course, you know, as I said, there's never like one party or the other. But if I think I'm the one who's been wronged, what can I do to move myself towards at least a stance of forgiveness? One decision that I can make is to not take revenge. I actually love the verse that Jazz read where God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. You know, I used to think it was a verse that showed this really angry God and felt a bit intimidated by that. But I've realised it's actually a very comforting verse. The idea is that revenge is not mine to take. I leave that in God's hands. It's not me. It's not for me to punish the one uh, who's wronged me. And it, what it does, understanding that Vengeance is mine, says God, I will repay. It leaves me free to be angry, to lament at what's happened to me, to grieve at my situation and the damage that I've suffered without having to do something to settle the score. I leave that to God. When I, um, I and I love the Psalms, actually, I love the really angry Psalms. Don't you love the angry sounds? Like all that smashing people's heads against the rocks. I mean, I can get into some of that. Now you're really worried about me. When I, um, I said I decided to delete my sermon, I deleted my sermon, I started all over again. And when I, one of the first things I did when I started all over again is went to this thing called the Forgiveness Project. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Forgiveness Project. It's a UK-based charity that collects people's real-life stories of forgiveness. And they do that to help people explore ideas around forgiveness and alternatives to revenge. And this website, or this project, it has no particular religious or political affiliation. 
It doesn't have the aim of persuading people that they should forgive or give five easy steps on how to forgive. All it does is collects and collates stories, stories of people who have forgiven and people who have been forgiven. Sometimes the story involves both parties. The stories are all very different from a parent whose child was murdered to a woman who accidentally killed a pedestrian in a moment of driver distraction to a prisoner meeting the, system, the sister of the victim that he stabbed in a drunken rage. All of the stories involve lives that were changed in an instant. And most of the stories involve some sort of insight into how the person came to live with what's happened. It's a really interesting website to just go and explore, The Forgiveness Project. There's a book as well. The creator of this Forgiveness Project said that after many years of collecting stories and after thinking for decades about forgiveness, this project's been going for a long time, this is what the founder and creator said. The only thing I know for sure is that the act of forgiving is fluid and active and can change from day to day, hour to hour, depending on how you feel when you wake up in the morning or what triggers you encounter during the day. Forgiveness may unfold like a mysterious discovery or it may be a totally conscious decision, something you line yourself up for having exhausted all other options. It may have a strong degree of pardoning attached to it, or it may be just a sense that you've released something poisonous or let go of something heavy that no longer weighs you down. In this sense, forgiveness means not allowing the pain of the past to dictate the path of the future. Forgiveness means not allowing the pain of the past to dictate the path of the future. I had two weeks scheduled for forgiveness. So I'm gonna to have to front up next week as well and say something intelligent. So let's look forward to that, shall we? <laughs> See what happens.